If you've already seen the 2008 movie Bronson, about Britain's so-called most notorious prisoner, don't worry. That rather theatrical piece of cinema didn't tell you much about the man, so there's so much more to see today. You might be thinking that it's coincidental that a man with such a reputation has the same name as a former Hollywood tough guy, but he wasn't called that at birth. The name was acquired during his bare-knuckle boxing days. He was actually born Michael Gordon Peterson. Yep, that doesn't sound quite as fearful. There's a lot of controversy about this man, regarding whether he should have been in prison for so long or if prison is to blame for his often crazy behavior. We discuss this and more in this episode of The Infographic Show, Britain's most notorious prisoner, Charles Bronson. As you know, he was born with the name Michael. His birth date was December 6, 1952. He spent his first few years in Wales and then moved to Luton, which isn't too far away from the capital London. It doesn't seem that he came from a rough and tumble background, given that his father ran a conservative club for a while and his aunt and uncle were a mayor and mayoress. His aunt actually once said this about him, as a boy he was a lovely lad. He was obviously bright and always good with children. He was gentle and mild-mannered, never a bully. He would defend the weak. He might have defended the weak, but it seems his penchant for violence and crime started early in life. After he moved up north at the age of 13, it seems that that's when trouble started. At that age, he was charged as a juvenile for stealing, and it's said he was part of a gang. He didn't much enjoy school and soon left to start working at an early age. His first job came when he moved back down to Luton. This was a very short two-week stint working in Tesco supermarket. Apparently, he was fired for attacking his manager. After this, it seems, crime became second nature to young Michael. He got in trouble for criminal damage but got off with a fine and some probation. He had lots of jobs, mostly related to labor or factory work, and we're told he enjoyed nothing more than a good night out on the town drinking gallons of beer and getting into fist fights with the locals. Easy to do in some areas of the UK. He likely wasn't short of foes on the mean streets of Luton. One of his jobs, we're told, was a circus strongman, so he was likely a hard man to fight. He got in trouble again after crashing a stolen lorry or a truck into another car, but again got off with just a fine as no one was seriously hurt. At this point, he is still in his teens. Yet again, he got into trouble, and at this time aged 19, when he was involved in a smash and grab which is basically smashing a car into a shop front and getting as much as you can. Again, he got off with just a fine and a suspended sentence. Age 20, perhaps, he got his chance to join what is sometimes called the straight and narrow, as he met a girl and got married. But apparently, she quite liked his tough guy persona, his tailored suits, and the fact that he spoke in a Cockney accent. They had a child and called him Michael Jonathan Peterson. According to the British press, the son is very private and has never spoken publicly about his notorious dad, so we can't tell you much about him. Moving on, now 22, Michael was arrested for armed robbery, and at this time the judge came down hard. He got seven years, but prison wasn't exactly a place he liked being, it seemed. During his first stint in prison in Liverpool, he attacked two other prisoners, and we're told he wasn't provoked. That got him time in solitary, something he would see much more of later. He was then transferred to prison in Hull, and again had issues with guards and prisoners. They gave him sedatives to calm him down, which apparently made him very ill. He also spent more time in isolation, and he was said to be a very difficult prisoner. On one occasion, he was out of solitary, he attacked a prisoner with a glass jug, and he was convicted of unlawful wounding. Yet again, he was moved, this time to the tough Armley Jail in Leeds, a foreboding looking place if you've ever seen one. So there he was, now serving time in what looks like a medieval castle. Even in 2018, the place is said to be the place with the highest rate of people taking their own lives, and in the press right now, it's said it's still very much an unsafe place for both prisoners and staff. Back in the 70s, it can't have been a holiday. But it seems he was too much for Armley, and he kept moving between a number of prisons, sometimes chained to the floor of the vans he traveled in. It's said if not in solitary, he would attack prisoners and guards. It's also said he incurred numerous vicious beatings from the guards after an attack. You might have seen that in the movie, which depicts these guards having to tackle him in numbers. During one time in solitary, while recovering from a beating, he got divorced. We imagine this might have been a low point, but it's said that one thing that kept him going was his solitary workout routine, keeping him healthy and fearsome. 
His book, Solitary Fitness, which he wrote after many years inside, has sold millions of copies. Reviews are actually very positive, although people talk about how strange the book can get at times. Profits from the book, says the media, go to children's charities. The British press tells us that his strength was quite unbelievable. He once bent the cell bars with his own hands, and it's said he holds six world records for strength and fitness. Another unofficial record he has set is the most prison rooftop protests by any British inmates. But right now, we're still in the 70s and a long way from fame or infamy. While in prison in London, he tried to poison an inmate, and it seems that was the straw that broke the camel's back. Enough with prison, he was transferred to a psychiatric facility. But guess who he met there? Two of Britain's most ruthless gangsters, the Cray Twins. He called them the best two guys I ever met. That friendship didn't last long though, as he was moved back to prison. What followed was more solitary, escape attempts, attacks on prisoners that ended with lifelong scars, more attacks, and finally, when the authorities were sick and tired, he was sectioned under the Mental Health Act. He was no longer just a criminal, but mentally ill. In 1978, he was again in another special facility, but it seems he didn't much like being forced to take medication and wasn't keen on the fact that he was surrounded by some of Britain's most disturbed people, men who would never leave the facility because they had done things to people we will not talk about. Yep, he didn't like some of these terrible men and at one point was said to be about five seconds away from killing a fellow patient or prisoner who had taken the life of an innocent child. In his own words, describing the people around him at the facility, I witnessed them running into walls, using their heads as rams. I've seen them fall unconscious doing this. There was one who just kept trying to eat himself, biting his arms, legs, and feet. He tried to kill another prisoner, and then in 1982, when still in the notorious Broadmoor, he led a rooftop protest that lasted three days and caused around $300,000 worth of damage. Now you can see why this guy became well known as a hard to deal with prisoner. But there was a lot more to come. He hadn't even started. He led two more rooftop protests and also went on a hunger strike, but in some ways he found solace in writing poems, sketching and creating cartoon strips. He even won awards for his work. It didn't stop him being violent though, just settled him down from time to time. Psychiatrists couldn't figure him out. And even though he was in a mental facility, he was never properly diagnosed. He once said, asylums are crazy places with crazy rules. If you're not mad when you arrive, you are when you leave. Again, he was moved from facility to prison, stabbing inmates, hitting others. More rooftop protests, more isolation, more beatings from the guards, more medicine. And perhaps his piece de resistance, he once strangled a prison governor. After that, he was not allowed out of isolation until he finished his sentence. He got out of prison in 1987 and almost immediately turned to crime. Although his first offense was quite comical, he bought a water pistol and modified it a bit, after which he forced a man at water pistol point to drive him to Luton, his favorite spot. There, he started bare knuckle fighting and earned the nickname Charles Bronson. He actually legally changed his name to this. Was this the start of a life on the outside? Not a chance. It's written that he would fight anyone and even challenged the king of bare knuckle fighting, Lenny McLean. It seems Lenny wanted no part of him, or at least when he agreed to fight, it was too late as Bronson was back in prison. In another fight, he was challenged to go against a large Rottweiler. He killed it and said later in life that he really regretted that. It was cash in hand though. He was only out of prison months and was back inside again for armed robbery. We won't go into details, but he fought again, attacked prisoners, guards, and had more time in solitary, was moved and moved and moved, and occasionally tried to start riots. In 1989, he was attacked himself, stabbed in the back several times, but he recovered. He wouldn't tell the police anything about his attackers. In 1992, he got out for the grand total of 53 days. He was jailed but got off. Then he was arrested again for having a shotgun and conspiracy to rob. It gets crazy here, because while on the remand, he took a librarian as a hostage. While negotiating with police, he had three demands, an inflatable doll, a helicopter, and a cup of tea. Yep, you heard that right. He was given eight years despite saying the gun was to blow off his own head. It wasn't the first time he had contemplated taking his own life. He was difficult again, transferred from prisons, and at times was left naked for many days on end in dark isolation. At one point, he was put in the worst spot in any prison in the UK, something called the Hannibal Cage. That had been created for another prisoner who had once killed inmates and was said to have spooned out one person's brain and eaten it. Even though at one point he attacked a governor, it's said he got much better after being allowed to interact with handicapped children. He also kept up his cartoon sketching. These were the quiet times. They didn't last long. 
He endured more solitary, more moves, and then in one prison he took two Iraqi hijackers as hostage in his cell. It's said he was going crazy after losing his father. It's also said that he told the guards if they came close he would snap off the heads of his hostages. He made his hostages tickle his feet and demanded they sing songs to him. To them he was known as the general. He demanded a plane, machine guns, ammunition, and a cheese and pickle sandwich. It seems later he just kept asking for ice cream. In the end, he let the hostages go and another seven years were added to his sentence. While in great physical shape, it's said that all the time in darkness and solitary had negative effects on his eyes and his social skills, and lawyers now started to get on his side. It's a pity then that he took one of them hostage. He let him go quickly though, but after one civilian worker criticized his drawings, he took him hostage too, and then started ripping up parts of the prison. Hmm, what else? Well, after the millennium, he got married again, converted to Islam, changed his name and took another hostage, wrote a book, sketched a lot, and then changed his name to Charles Arthur Charlie Salvador, out of respect for his favorite artist. The movie came out and he became a household name. Until then, not many people knew about him. Thousands of people around the world started to support him, saying even though he had been a bad boy, his incarceration had just gone on too long. But he couldn't stop messing up. In 2014, he attacked another governor. That same year, his artwork went up for auction, and his 200 pieces, often dark in nature, fetched around 30,000 pounds. Bronson donated a large part of this to the brain tumor charity and Keech Hospice in Lutton. Bronson said the old him was now dead, and he was born again as the artist Salvador. He created more works too, donating to other charities and one-time Oxford's homeless. He also got married to an actress in 2017, and she's hoping to see him out soon. In total, out of the 44 plus years he served, 36 of them have been in solitary confinement sometimes without light. In 2018, it was said that he is in open prison, but will have his case reviewed in two years and could get out. That might not happen though, as he's got a life sentence for one of his kidnappings. That was a teacher in 1999 that he held for two days. The British media reports that he allegedly smothered himself in butter, age 65, and challenged the guards to a fight. We'll leave you with something he once said, I'm a nice guy, but sometimes I lose all my senses and become nasty. That doesn't make me evil, just confused. Men freeze in place, holding pickaxes and shovels at the ready inside a well-lit tunnel under the Mexican countryside. They can hear the vibrations of a vehicle above them and wary of making any noise that might give them away, hold their work as the prison patrol passes overhead. 30 feet below the prison's main yard, there's little chance of being discovered, but after several months of secret tunneling, they can't take any chances, especially when they are so close to their goal. The prison cell of Mexico's most famous drug kingpin, Joaquin El Chapo Guzman. For months, they've tunneled through solid rock with nothing more than pickaxes and shovels, moving as fast as they can with their limited equipment but with great caution. The work would go much faster if they could use modern tunnel digging equipment like jackhammers and boring machines, but not only would that create noise that might give them away, it would draw a great deal of attention to their staging area just a mile from the prison perimeter. Prior to tunnel digging, El Chapo's powerful drug cartel purchased a small plot of land as close to the prison as they could get and began constructing two small homes as a cover for their real intentions. The homes never made it past a rough brick outer shell though, because of course they would not be inhabited. Instead, they provided the cover needed to start construction on the tunnel that would set El Chapo free. But the tunnel crew was facing incredible pressure to finish as quickly as possible. Due to his history of escaping from prison and evading police raids, Mexican authorities could at any time transfer El Chapo to another prison in order to foil any possible escape attempts. Every day the tunnelers took to get their boss was another day the entire thing could be for nothing, and a new escape attempt in a completely different location would have to be devised. But that's not all. The unfinished buildings were beginning to draw attention from local officials and curious villagers alike. Why would someone start construction on an empty piece of land and then suddenly stop with only a shell of a home built? Time was running out and pressure was mounting. Inside his cell, El Chapo was the model prisoner. Despite his long history of ordering some of the most horrific violence Mexico has ever seen, El Chapo maintained a cordial and even pleasant attitude with his prison guards and fellow inmates. His conversations over the phone were carefully monitored, his mail checked by prison officials, but not a single hint of the ongoing plot was ever revealed. El Chapo was a true professional by now and patient, but his patience was running out. The tunnel diggers faced a daunting task from the start, and they knew they had to move fast. 
Despite the incredible pressure on them, however, they managed to not only reach El Chapo before any potential prison transfer, but they wound up breaking through to El Chapo's cell just 16 months into his prison stay. The tunnel they constructed was sophisticated, impressing officials who would later remark that a tunnel of that magnitude should have taken 18 months to two years to construct. Its walls were reinforced when needed, with wooden paneling, and a generator pumped fresh air through a mile-long ventilation system to keep the tunnel oxygenated. On the ground, the tunnelers had laid down rails and used a motorcycle to shuttle two carts, which were filled with dirt back and forth along the shaft. Once El Chapo was reached, he would ride on that same motorcycle and quickly shuttle the mile distance to freedom. All that dirt, though, had to go somewhere, and so the tunnelers cleverly transferred it to the tunnel opening, where others would spread the dirt around on the field outside, rather than dump it in giant piles, which would no doubt draw attention. Still, the presence of fresh dirt littering acres of empty fields was sure to eventually draw attention, and questions that would not be easy to answer for the fake construction crew above ground. Suddenly, though, in the middle of the night on July 12, 2015, the sound of metal scraping came from El Chapo's shower inside his cell. Moments later, the ceramic bottom of the shower popped free, and a friendly face greeted the imprisoned drug lord, beckoning him into the darkness below. Wasting no time, El Chapo ducked into the secret tunnel, climbing down 30 feet into a tunnel only as wide across as a man but just tall enough for El Chapo to stand upright. Often derided for his short stature by his enemies, the tunnel diggers had made sure that the tunnel was just tall enough so the boss wouldn't have to hunch as he walked along it. A classy prison escape if we ever heard of one. A few feet into the mouth of the tunnel, El Chapo boarded a small motorcycle which had been affixed to metal tracks. The carts full of dirt that had pushed along for months now were gone, and just moments after leaving his cell, El Chapo was cruising along the well-lit tunnel like a kid on an amusement park ride. Two minutes later, El Chapo ended his joyride by climbing up wooden steps and popping up into the empty shell of a home his crew had been secretly working from for a year and a half. Changing into clean clothes, El Chapo then climbed onto a truck and whisked away into the dark of the night, leaving behind an incredible mile-long secret tunnel and completely frustrated prison system and Mexican government both. El Chapo would be caught again just months after his escape, after his newest safe house was given away weeks before his arrival by careless gunmen who were spotted by locals. Responding to reports of heavily armed men, Mexican officials put the house under surveillance and intercepted communications saying that grandma or aunt was coming to visit. Realizing this had to be a high-value target, officials waited for their chance to strike. One month later, Mexican Special Forces soldiers raided the home and killed several bodyguards, but El Chapo and one of his most senior lieutenants escaped via, you guessed it, a secret tunnel. Popping up a mile from the home, the two stole a vehicle at gunpoint, though the driver immediately reported it to the police. After issuing an alert for the stolen vehicle, the federal police officers discovered the stolen car and placed the two fugitives under arrest. El Chapo, however, wouldn't go without at least trying to buy his freedom. Knowing how easily corruptible public officials had been in the past, El Chapo bribed the police officers, offering them money, homes, and even lucrative jobs if they let him go. Little did the desperate kingpin know, however, that he was dealing with a brand new brand of Mexican police officer one not as easily corrupted as his predecessors. All four officers refused El Chapo, after which his offers of honey turned into vinegar, telling the police officers that they were all going to die. The four officers sent pictures to El Chapo to their superiors, only to be warned that the police had received a tip-off that 40 heavily armed assassins were en route to free El Chapo. With friendly forces still tied up at the compound, the officers were ordered to a nearby motel on the outskirts of town, where they holed themselves up in an empty room and prepared for a possible shootout for their lives. All the while, El Chapo laughed, echoing his previous threats. Suddenly, a convoy of vehicles lit up the roadside, clearly headed for the lonely motel. The officers, armed with M16 assault rifles and pistols, prepared for what was surely their last stand. El Chapo taunted them, telling them they were about to face death and after them, their families. Yet the officers held their ground, ready to die for duty's sake if need be. As the vehicles began to turn into the parking lot, however, El Chapo's taunts died in his throat. Once the glare of the headlights faded, the barricaded officers could see military trucks full of Mexican Marines rushing to take up defensive positions around the motel. Minutes later, a thoroughly defeated and dejected-looking El Chapo was dragged into an SUV and rushed off to an airfield. 
El Chapo would not escape from Mexican prison again, and two years later any hope of ever escaping again would be extinguished as Mexico approved an extradition request to the United States. Safely in U.S. custody, El Chapo faces life in prison, and though he may have been one of the deadliest men in Mexico's history, the drug kingpin would ultimately be remembered as nothing more than a sobbing mess as he begged U.S. justice officials for leniency, which they would not grant. Believe it or not, there's a fairly long list of people who have survived their executions. We might look at the case of William Duell, a 17-year-old English boy who was hanged in 1740 in London and then came back to life as he was about to be dissected. He was later exiled to North America. Then you had John Babacombe Lee, another Englishman nicknamed the man they couldn't hang, after surviving three executions. More recently, you have the case of Romel Broom, an American man sentenced to death by lethal injection. He survived that ended up writing a book called Survivor on Death Row, but it seems he spoke too early, as he's scheduled for another execution in 2020. But today we'll talk about one of the best known survivor stories in this episode of the Infographics Show, Death Row Inmate Who Survived His Own Execution. As we've said, a handful of people have survived their executions. You can read quite recent cases too, such as American inmate Doyle Lee Ham, who was said to have experienced torturous and traumatic hours in the execution chamber before staff admitted that they had failed. The US media reported in 2017 that a man called Alva Campbell became the third man to survive an execution in the country in recent decades, and that was just a matter of the execution team not being able to find a vein in which to inject the lethal drugs. But perhaps the tale we're about to tell you now is the most moving, as the person that survived was only 17 years old. It's also the first case of someone surviving the electric chair in the USA. If you've seen our show on Old Sparky, you'll know that executions in the early days could certainly be horrific to watch, but eventually the inmates succumbed to the shock. That was not the case for 17-year-old Willie Francis. Let's have a look at what events led to him ending up in the chair. Francis was a young, poor African American in 1946, and at the time of his lucky escape, many people believed that the hand of God had interrupted this macabre spectacle of official murder. For one thing, he was just so young, and a lot of people decreed the execution of a boy not yet a man. And another thing was the fact that the American justice system at the time could have been said to be harsh for certain people of certain races and certain social standing. He lived in a place called St. Martinville, located in southwestern Louisiana. You can read articles about this place in in the 40s with one saying that the town had two sections, one for the white people and the other for the colored. The white tended to their own business and the colored tend to theirs. Yes, this was a time when racism was pervasive in some parts of the US, and despite the backwards attitudes of some people, there was a lot of support for young Willie when he was condemned to death. After the botched execution attempt, Francis wrote from his prison cell, A lot of people write me to ask me to tell them something about what I did when I was young. I'm only 18 now, so I guess they mean when I was very young. But what had he done? One of 13 children, Francis said life was hard as a kid, but he wrote he had fond memories of the hard knock life, playing baseball with a broomstick handle and going out with friends causing mischief. When he got older, he was given a job by a man called Andrew Thomas. Thomas owned the local drugstore, hiring Francis to do errands and keep the store tidy. They apparently got along and Francis was called a nice boy and cooperative by folks who visited the store. He was, however, called illiterate by some, or at least close to that. Others said he was slow, but later when Francis was writing for from his prison cell, it was proven that he could not just write, but express himself in a deep and meaningful way. We're telling you this because this case was very controversial, and at the time and for years after, people tried to understand why this seemingly nice kid committed a murder. That murder was of the drugstore owner, Thomas. When her son was convicted of slaying his boss, the mother told the press, there wasn't no bad in him, I just don't understand. Quite a few people thought that this young boy, perhaps somewhat mentally challenged, had admitted guilt to something he didn't do, the murder of Andrew Thomas, described as a handsome, educated bachelor with his own successful business. He was killed at his home home during that night of November 7, 1944. His body was discovered the next day, splayed on the floor near the house steps. Two witnesses, Alvin and Ida Van Brocklin, had said that they heard gunshots in the night. They didn't see who did the firing, though. It was later said that Thomas had been dining with friends and upon returning home had been met by a gunman who unloaded five bullets in him. Two hit him in the back, two in his left side, and one went right through his eye. It said his pockets had been emptied. 
prompting police to say the reason for the murder was robbery. Rumors spread around town. It said he was quite the ladies' man, and many speculated he had been killed by one of those ladies' husbands or lovers. For months, people believed this to be the case. Sometime later, police were looking for a drug dealer, and it said that Willie Francis just happened to see the police. He wasn't dealing drugs, but it said that when he saw the two white police officers running his way, he just took off out of fright. That was a mistake, as running made the police think that he was guilty of something. Later, Francis was interviewed by cops at the police station. They said he seemed frightened and he stuttered a lot, but it turned out that Francis had stuttered his whole life. The cops didn't think that they had captured a drug dealer that they had been looking for, but guess what they found on Francis? They found Andrew Thomas's wallet and identification card. That's what they said anyway. It said that within three to five minutes, the police got a full confession for the murder of Thomas. They also managed to get a confession for an unrelated assault and robbery in another town. The facts cops did this in a few minutes, and the fact that the boy was said to be somewhat slow would compel people to ask if the interrogation and subsequent confessions were perhaps a part of a setup. Francis was questioned without a lawyer, without any advice, without any family member or friend being present. The confession read, I, Willie Francis, now 16 years old, I stole the gun from Mr. Ogasey at St. Martinville, Louisiana, and kill Andrew Thomas November 9, 1944, or about that time at St. Martinville, Louisiana. It was a secret about me and him. I took a black purse with card 1280182 in it, $4 in it. He wrote a second confession the next day. This one contained more details about how many shots had been fired and where the body was found. As for the trial, it said Francis's lawyers were in Inept. One writer says they never questioned for indictment, nor did they make a motion for a change of venue, despite the widespread publicity about the murder of a beloved white member of a small community by a black youth. The twelve white jurors found him guilty, and he was to be executed. Francis' lawyers never challenged the verdict. By the way, Francis has pleaded not guilty. The jury never heard any argument pertaining to the possibility of a forced confession or that evidence could have been planted. The confession itself was good enough for him to be convicted. Many people in the town thought that some Something smelled funny, as did many others across the U.S. The local press wrote, quote, Throughout the trial, the Negro was uninterested and showed very little emotion." Unquote. Francis wrote that he was concerned that he might act like a crybaby on the day of his execution, but was relieved to hear that the actual execution would only tickle. On May 3, 1946, he had his head shaved and prepared to have 2,500 volts of electricity flow through him. On his cell wall, it was discovered that he had written the words, Of course I am not a killer. Police never did have a motive for the murder, nor any substantial evidence other than the confession of a slow 16-year-old boy. He was taken to Louisiana State Penitentiary in Angola to be put in the chair nicknamed Gruesome Gertie. The lever was pulled, and this is how Francis later described the feeling. I couldn't stop the jumping. If that was tickling, it sure was a funny kind. I thought for a minute I was going to knock the chair over. Then I was all right. I thought I was dead. Other reports state that he shouted, take it off, take it off, as the executioners tried to give him a second round of shocks. It's said that after the failed attempt, he wasn't even injured, but he said he felt kind of dizzy. Some people said this was a miracle, and a righteous one as they didn't believe that he was guilty nor had had a fair trial. Louisiana's governor James Davis then said in six days they would send him to the chair again. That didn't happen, and much of America got behind the young man. He once wrote, I felt just like a movie star. I didn't have any idea I had so many friends. He also later described how his execution felt, and something he called the chair. He wrote, you feel like you got a mouthful of cold peanut butter, and you see little blue and pink and green speckles, the kind that shines in a rooster's tail. What ensued were many months months of legal arguments. Not only did some people believe he wasn't even, but lawyers now argued that to subject a person to a second execution was cruel and unusual punishment. Prosecution lawyers argued against that, stating the first attempt had not worked at all and he had not been hurt. But the evidence supporting this in hindsight seems pretty weak. The court also heard that the botch was just an accident, and such accidents happen for which no man is to blame. That meant no one was at fault, and there should be another execution. We might also note that later the state was petitioned, with lawyers stating this about the botched execution. The scene was a disgraceful and inhuman exhibition, that as soon as the switch controlling the current was taken off, the drunken executioner cursed Francis and told him he would be back to finish electrocuting him, and if the electricity did not kill him, he would kill him with a rock. The drunken men in charge that night were accused of being 
sadistic, not giving Francis the full shock because they wanted to torture him. He was then returned to the chair on May 9, 1947, and this time he didn't survive. He was just 18 years old. If anything positive came out of all of this, it's the fact that the justice system was exposed for not supporting Francis in the first place. This poor black boy may or may not have killed his boss, but he certainly wasn't protected as he should have been by the American justice system. Many Americans of all colors saw and criticized what had happened. At the time of writing, there are 2,738 inmates on death row in the United States. This number can change quite frequently, given that some prisoners of course might be executed but others might have their sentence commuted. They might have their sentence overturned or someone else might join them on death row. Right now, only 2% of people on death row are women. 42% of people are classified as white, 41% black, 13% Latino, 1.9% Asian, 1% Native American, and the rest is stated as unknown. You can be on death row for a long, long time. And believe it or not, the average time spent there from sentencing to the day in the execution chamber is 20 years. Let's now see what happens on that final day, 8 p.m. The inmate is taken from death row to another cell. This involves a drive from the prison to what one former official in a documentary called the death house. That official said prior to leaving death row and getting in the van to come to the death house, the inmate will be searched really well. He said this wasn't only because a weapon might harm a guard, but mainly because they don't want the prisoner committing suicide. Another guard interviewed said he once took a route to the death house where they couldn't be ambushed. Tensions are high during these events. He also said the atmosphere in the van was solemn. We all knew where we were going and why. Nobody said a whole lot. Once the prisoner goes into the death house, he won't ever see the light of day again, unless some kind of appeal works for him. 9 p.m. After booking in, he can sleep until he's awakened, if indeed he can sleep. We managed to find the diary of one prisoner who described his move to his new cell. They stripped me out with a female officer present, he wrote. Now, personally, I'm not the shy type, but having a female officer on death watch is just one more humiliation. We're told that during this time, the prisoner is on something called death watch. He's watched all the time in case he tries to take his own life. The cell is close to the execution chamber and it is very private, a space where the inmate can reflect on life as the hours count down. This might happen just one day before, but we found cases where it was a couple of days. Prisoners will also be given special clothes in most cases, much smarter than prison attire. The man who kept the diary wrote he was happy to have at last a pair of trousers with a button and zip. We don't know how well he slept, but in his diary he comments about watching the guards sleep. This is what he wrote, good for them, I'm sure this has to be stressful for them. So a moment's relaxation is well earned. I also enjoy the irony, who exactly is watching whom? One other thing he says is that the death house is much cleaner than his death row cell. He remarks that there's not a bug in sight, whereas in his last cell it was like going on safari. 4.30 AM The inmate is woken up bright and early in his cell. We should add here times might change from place to place, petitions might still be pending, and there's a phone right outside the cell. In the cell, there's a shower, a toilet, a bed, and a desk. During this last day, the prisoner is allowed to see family and can be visited by a chaplain. As for calling people, the inmate can write down a list of phone numbers he intends to call and give that to the guards. One guard interviewed said we would dial the number for him and then allow him to make his call. But after the prisoner has called the last person on his list, the only person he'll have to talk to is the chaplain. We're told that after this last call, it can be a very traumatic time. One chaplain interviewed said I was to do everything and anything to help him face that last day, whatever it was, writing letters, making phone calls, singing songs, listening, listening, and listening. 8 AM We said they can have visitors, but 8 AM is the cutoff time. After that, the prisoner is on his own besides having prison staff around and, of course, anyone involved in his case should something change. The chaplain can still visit too. At around this time, in the actual death chamber, it's very likely that the equipment will be tested. This might mean checking that the straps on the gurney work or even checking the phone to the governor's office is working. Yep, imagine it wasn't and there was a last minute reprieve. If the form of execution is the chair, then its electrical components have to be tested. In one case we found, the actual governor was the person who they strapped in to test if he could get out or move out of the straps. I didn't want my staff to get kicked in the face, he remarked. 10.30 AM Now it's lunchtime. Yes, this is an early lunch, but let's not forget the inmate has been up a long time already. Lunch is not special, it's not the last meal. From what we can see, it's the same old prison food. 
The only difference is that the prisoner gets to eat it in a private setting. The inmate we talked about before said what he got for lunch was orange juice and what he called a prison issue donut. For quite a few hours now, the prisoner has a lot of time to think and, as you know, they have a desk and can write any number of letters, goodbyes, or just reflect on life. 3 p.m. If the inmate is to get the electric chair, he'll have his head shaved around this time, but this might also happen later in the day. He might still talk to a spiritual advisor, but food might also be on his mind right now. Around this time, maybe an hour or so later, the inmate will also be asked to dress in one of those smart clothes he's been given. He'll be asked to take a shower before he does this, a shower at least in total privacy. He'll have already written down what he wants to eat, so in the kitchen the death house chef will be doing all the preparations. 4 p.m. The inmate will receive his last meal. Contrary to popular belief, inmates can't just order what they want. It makes sense, because it's highly unlikely that authorities would splash out on the finest Wagyu beef. In Florida, for instance, the maximum this last meal can cost is 40 bucks, but this will change from state to state. Those poor convicts over in Oklahoma only get a limit of $15, or at least when one documentary we watched was made. That is hardly enough to go crazy on your last meal. It's still good, though. As one Death House chef pointed out, this meal is the only choice of food they might have had in two decades. In some states, though, prisoners no longer get a bespoke last meal and only get the usual prison food. To give you an idea of what inmates might choose, we will list some last meals. Serial killer John Wayne Gacy had 12 fried shrimp, an entire bucket of KFC, some french fries, and a whole load of strawberries. The man behind the Oklahoma bombing, Timothy McVeigh, just opted for two pints of mint chocolate chip ice cream. A killer from Florida called Angel Nieves Diaz chose absolutely nothing. The terrible Ted Bundy did pretty much the opposite, ordering a steak cooked medium rare, eggs on the side, over easy, some hash browns, slices of toast, and some milk and juice. The infamous female serial killer Eileen Warnos was good with just a cup of coffee, while a murderer called Stephen Woods must have been famished. We should add that many thought he was innocent and his last words were, you're not about to witness an execution, you're about to witness a murder. Before that, he asked to eat, according to the website Ranker, two pounds of bacon, a large four-meat pizza, four fried chicken breasts, two drinks each of Mountain Dew, Pepsi, root beer, and sweet tea, two pints of ice cream, five chicken fried steaks, two hamburgers with bacon, fries, and a dozen garlic breadsticks with marinara on the side. That state must have had a big budget. 5 p.m. The witnesses will likely arrive at the prison. This might be family of the victims, journalists, family of the condemned, friends of the condemned, or whoever the condemned has asked to be witnesses. They will be told to try and stay quiet when they reach the witness room. Before that, they'll wait somewhere else. In most states, civilians who didn't know anyone involved will be asked to witness the execution. 6 to 8 p.m. The time of execution can vary from state to state, but it's just about always in the early evening. At this point, the prisoner will be taken to the execution room. The witnesses will soon be in the witness room. Prisoners, for the most part, will just walk right there and not give the guards any problems. In some states, this will be a five-man team, just in case there is a struggle. But that doesn't happen often. One warden interviewed who had done 89 executions said he'd only had one prisoner that was hard to deal with. The walk to the chamber in most places is only about 10 feet, just over 3 meters. The guys would usually walk right up to the electric chair. They weren't forced by the staff. By that point, they've already accepted what will happen. A former Death Watch guard told Business Insider. Another guard in a separate interview said the same. Inmates usually act very dignified. It's a very clean procedure, there's no hustling and bustling. It's not always this way, especially if the prisoner is protesting his innocence. In 2018, the BBC reported that one man in Florida was screaming and thrashing before he was executed, screaming to everyone that they were murdering an innocent man. One warden said the first thing that catches his eye is that gurney, which is the place he's going to die. If it is lethal injection, which it often is, the prisoner is told to sit on the gurney and then lay down. There will be a tie-down team, each responsible for a part of the prisoner's body. Doctors will usually not be at the execution because it's not in line with their code of ethics, so there will be a special team to administer the drugs. This is not always easy as the veins tend to hide during this stressful time. Some of them had burnt veins from drugs which would make the process longer and more painful, said one former warden. When the catheters are in place, the inmate will be secured again. There's about 15 minutes before the execution. Believe it or not, some inmates have got a stay, which means a call to stop the execution, during these last minutes. If that doesn't happen, the witnesses are brought into the main room and the curtains are undrawn. 
Some inmates might make a final statement. It depends on the state, but some prisoners might be given a few minutes, and others just allowed to make a brief statement. Kentucky gives two minutes, but in Pennsylvania you can't talk at all, and the statement can only be written. Here are some fairly recent examples of last words. I'm ready to roll, time to get this party started. My last words will be, Hoka hey, it's a good day to die. Somebody needs to kill my trial attorney. I think that governor's phone is broke, he hasn't called yet. These are, of course, unusual ones, and most people will just say their goodbyes to loved ones or give an apology for what they did. At this point, the chaplain might lay a hand on the prisoner, sometimes where there's a pulse. The warden will give the signal to the executioner, and then it's time. The end of the day, the end of a life. You would think that when strapped to a gurney, knowing the life force in you is about to expire, you'd want to say something nice to someone, or profound, or perhaps apologize to the family of the victim that's watching your demise. Then again, if you were an innocent person about to have his veins filled with a lethal cocktail, you might not be in the mood to deliver a tender speech. You might also be a ruthless and heartless psychopath that wants to fill the air one last time with your monstrous voice. As you'll now find out, that has happened, and it might send shivers down your spine hearing what they said. First up, Richard Aaron Cobb. Cobb was executed by lethal injection in 2013 in Texas. His crime was walking into a convenience store with an accomplice and robbing it. It didn't stop there. They took two female employees and one male customer and forced them into a car. They took them to a secluded place and shot them execution style, and then drove away thinking they were all dead. Only the man actually died. His last words were very strange, starting out nihilistic. He then finished with something very surprising. I hope that someday this absurdity that humanity has come to will come to an end. And then seconds later after he started to pass away. Wow, this is great. Thank you, Warden. This next one is slightly more gruesome. John Wayne Gacy. You all know the story of this man, and we won't go into detail about what he did. He murdered 33 people in the 70s and hid many of the bodies under his house. He is one of the USA's worst serial killers. His last words show that he had no remorse whatsoever. They were, kiss my… We can't say that last word, otherwise the video will get demonetized. But we are sure you can guess what it is. There's no cursing in this next one, but we think you'll agree, it's pretty darn dark. Peter Kürten. You've never heard of this guy, we bet. He was a German serial killer at a time where there were few of them about in Germany. That was the early 20th century. He killed at least nine people and did terrible things with the bodies. One other thing was that he drank the blood of his victims, and that's why he was sometimes named the Vampire of Dusseldorf. In 1931, he was beheaded by guillotine, and just before that happened, he looked at his psychiatrist and said, tell me after my head has been chopped off, will I still be able to hear, at least for a moment, the sound of my own blood gushing from the stump of my neck? That would be the pleasure to end all pleasures. Before the blade came down, the psychiatrist replied, no. Eileen Warnos. This woman you might have seen portrayed in a Hollywood movie called Monster. She worked selling her body on the streets and killed six of her male customers. She claimed she was defending herself, but that didn't hold up in court. She's now known as one of America's worst female serial killers. She was executed in 2002, and just before that, she promised she'd come back to life again. She said, I'd just like to say I'm sailing with the rock, and I'll be back like Independence Day with Jesus June 6th, like the movie Big Mothership and all. I'll be back. Sticking with serial murderers, this next monster fits the bill. Carl Panzran. This guy was a serial killer in the US at the start of the 20th century. He committed murders among many other despicable things. He said he had killed 22 people in all. He was sentenced to be hanged in 1930 and just before the executioner put the cover on his head, he spat in his face. He was asked if he had any last words. This is how he replied, yes, hurry it up you Hoosier bastard, I could kill a dozen men while you're screwing around. In case you're wondering, a Hoosier is someone from the state of Indiana. Up next is arguably the funniest on this list, James French. French killed two people in the late 50s and mid 60s in the USA. One of those people was his cellmate. The two didn't get along very well. His actual last words when sitting in the electric chair were, there's nothing else to say. But the last thing he said to a reporter was this, if I were covering my execution, do you know what I'd say in the newspaper headline tomorrow? The reporter said, what? He answered, French fries. Yep, that was amusing. We think this next guy was also attempting to make a joke. Jeffrey Matthews. Matthews shot and killed his uncle during a robbery, and he was executed in 2011 in Oklahoma because of that. His last words aren't exactly frightening, but his dark sense of humor at the end is perhaps a little bit shocking. He said a few things, but his very last words were, I think that governor's phone is broke, he hasn't called yet. Robert Charles Comer. 
You can say the same about this man. At the end, he either had a twisted sense of humor or was on another planet, mentally speaking. In 1987, he killed a man, but he had also committed some other serious crimes throughout his life. When he asked if he wanted to say something at the end, he said, Go Raiders! That's in reference to an American football team. Such a statement, you might assume, encapsulates how little he thought about himself and life and his victims. Robert Alton Harris Alton was executed in California in 1992 for multiple murders. He'd been a career criminal with a long rap sheet, although his killing of two boys is why he got the gas chamber. He was incredibly heartless if you read his story, but we won't go into it today. At the end, he became poetic, his last words being, You can be a king or a street sweeper, but everybody dances with the Grim Reaper. He's not wrong about that. He's not as amusing as the next person, though. Vincent Gutierrez This guy was executed in Texas in 2007 after being found guilty of killing a man. Gutierrez had been trying to steal the man's car and then shot him in the back. He was under the age of 18 when it happened. He said a few things for his last words and apologized for what he had done, but then he finished it off by saying, Where's my stunt double when you need one? John William Rook Rook believed his difficult childhood was the reason he committed a murder in 1980 in the US. He had 12 hot dogs for his last meal, and then just before they took his life away, he thanked them and said, Freedom, freedom at last. James W. Rogers Rogers was sentenced to death after killing a fellow worker at a uranium mine in 1957. The two had fallen out over quite a big issue, and that was how a scoop shovel should be properly greased. They didn't see eye to eye regarding the grease, and Rogers shot the other man. He was sentenced to death by firing squad. When Rogers was ready to have the firing squad finish his life, he was asked if he had any final words. His reply was, I done told you my last request, a bulletproof vest. Charlie Livingston In 1983, this man shot and killed a woman in Houston during a robbery. He didn't seem to see the point of final words when the time came and he made that point, saying, You all brought me here to be executed, not to make a speech. That's it. That was simple enough, quite different from what's coming up. Douglas Roberts this man from Texas was quite the opposite, and he had quite a lot to say on the day of his execution by lethal injection in 2005. He'd been found guilty of kidnapping, robbery, and murder. When the time came for his last words, he said, I've been hanging around this popsicle stand way too long. Before I leave, I want to tell you all, when I die, bury me deep, lay two speakers at my feet, put some headphones on my head, and rock and roll me when I'm dead. The media later reported that he was upbeat and animated before his execution. Frederick Wood Wood was another joker, albeit with a dark sense of humor. He was put to the electric chair in 1963 for the crime of murder. When asked what his final words would be, he replied, Gents, this is an educational project. You're about to witness the damaging effect electricity has on Wood. The next couple of people you could say are unique on this list. Mary Blandy Now we're going really back in time, and this is the story of an English woman whose father didn't approve of her relationship. She looked to poison to deal with this problem. She was hanged in 1752 and at the time she was wearing a dress. She was worried people might look up the dress, even though it wouldn't matter much after she was dead. Still, she told the executioner, for the sake of decency, gentlemen, don't hang me high. Sarah Good now we go even farther back to the Salem Trials in Massachusetts in 1692. Good was in her 30s when she was accused of being a witch and then sentenced to death. All 12 jurors agreed that she had to be a witch. She was accused of lacking in self-discipline and being a servant of the devil. She had only challenged locals regarding their very strict Puritan values, but they had said that that made her in league with Satan. The Reverend Nicholas Noyes was there at the end and still tried to get her to confess, and she of course refused. Her last words were, I'm no more a witch than you are a wizard, and if you take away my life, God will give you blood to drink. Twenty-five years later, Noyes had an aneurysm, and as the story goes, he coughed up blood and choked on it. We should say this is what's called popular legend. But as the witch trials were so terrible, we imagine many people might hope it happened. While these witch trials were madness to the highest degree, Mary's husband at least sued the courts for what's happened to her, and he won. Now we go back to the present day and a couple of guys that look death straight in the eye. Clarence Ray Allen this man was executed in California for killing three people. He was executed in 2006 when he was the ripe old age of 76. He was very sick at the time, and a lot of people wondered why the death sentence, since it seemed he didn't have much time left anyway. His last words were, Hoka hey, it's a good day to die. Melvin White White had committed the terrible crime of murdering a child, and he was executed in Texas in 2005. 
We won't go into the details, but what he did shocked a lot of people. Not many folks felt sorry for this man as he went to the gurney for his dose of lethal drugs. He did say he was sorry for what he did and then said, all right, warden, let's give them what they want. The next couple of people you might say didn't sit too well in their chair of death. Tory Twain McNabb In 2017, this man was given lethal injection in the state of Alabama. He'd been convicted of killing a police officer. He and his lawyers had tried to stop it going through by saying the punishment was cruel and unusual, but that didn't work. He went to the gurney an angry man, and with both his hands, he pointed two middle fingers in the air. He then said, Mom, sis, look at my eyes. I got no tears. I'm unafraid. To the state of Alabama, I hate you. I hate you. I hate you. Thomas J. Grasso we have perhaps saved the strangest last words to last. And this was the execution of a man that had been convicted of two murders of elderly women. He was given lethal injection in the state of Oklahoma in 1995. He wrote a short poem before his death and part of it went like this. The warden will read my last creed and the deadly brew will flow as the poison drips into my veins and from my body life does drain. But his last words were in the form of a very practical complaint. We guess he was being ironic. Those words were, I did not get my SpaghettiOs. I got spaghetti. I want the press to know this. A 20-year-old man, a man who believes he has become a victim of the justice system in the US, wants out. In the psych ward where he's been placed, he bides his time until he sees his chance to get into a medical cabinet. The man has no problem picking locks. He'll pick many locks for many years to come. Inside that cabinet is a bottle of the extremely potent psychotropic substance called LSD. He takes the bottle of that and again, when the time is right, he sneaks into the staff room and pours the entire bottle into a pot of boiling coffee. The ingoing and outgoing staff are all going to get a hit. A hit you could call heroic. In his own words, the man later said the plan was when all the people were freaked out enough, I was going to pick the locks and go. A few aides and staff on the ward between them unwittingly took acid to the amount of around 100 tabs. Perhaps you're not the type of person who knows much about things like LSD, but let us tell you 100 tabs between a handful of people would have caused them to hallucinate wildly. The plan didn't exactly go how that guy wanted it to go. Far from it. Not long after those coffees were drunk, one aide was down in the basement watching the clothes dryer spin around and around. His pupils were now large black shimmering discs, and he stared at that spinning drum and just lost his mind. The machine became his mortal enemy. The aide screamed at the dryer, he threw punches at it, kicked it. While upstairs in the ward, people were tripping out of their minds. One of the female psychiatric doctors didn't seem to know where she was or who she was. She was seen madly dancing up and down the ward and, in a sexually suggestive way, informing the shocked inmates about how deliriously hot she was feeling. The scene was a phantasmagoria of horror and comedy. But during all that utter madness, the plotter and executor of that communal trip could not make his escape. Security was soon called and the staff were taken to some place to calm down from their mega trip. A clothes dryer had been ripped apart and in one man's eyes, defeated. Welcome to the life of Mark DeFreist, the Houdini of Florida, a masterful escape artist, a veritable genius who just couldn't find his way in life. A life that from the outside might look part comedy, but in reality, his life sentence on this earth has been filled mostly with a devastating tragedy. Mark was born in 1960 and grew up with his father and stepmom. His father had served during the Second World War in the OSS, an organization that would later evolve into the CIA. Father and son were close, and the former imparted his vast knowledge to the latter. This would serve Mark well in his many prison escapes, but the child was different. Some say he was a savant. Most others now say he was a high-functioning autistic and still is today. Mark didn't understand much about the world and didn't socialize much with other kids. He spent most of his time by himself and he despised school. They moved him to a disciplinary boys' school to temper the child's waywardness, but he ran away, something he would keep doing his entire life. All he really wanted to do was take things apart and put them back together again. At the back of the house, there was a workshop, something Mark would later call his Frankenstein's lab. There he would mess around with chemicals, blowing himself up on two occasions, and he would rewire appliances, take apart clocks, all with the skill and dexterity of a seasoned expert. His life fell apart when he was 19. His father died, and knowing what Mark loved most, he bequeathed all his tools to him. This was the start of the beginning of tragedy because Mark, not really knowing how wills work, took the tools before that will had been probated. That just means made valid. His cold and stony stepmother, a woman who had never cared for Mark, called the cops. Those cops chased Mark down one night, and on seeing those flashing lights, this young man who didn't quite get how things worked in society fled on foot. He had no idea why those cops were after him. 
He had no idea about how wills were supposed to be dealt with. He was arrested and charged with theft, and also got a charge for being in possession of a weapon. Next came jail. This just didn't seem fair to the young man, a guy that thought he'd taken what was rightly his. One day after Bible study class, he and the other inmates were being led back to their cells, when some men just started running for it, heading to the razor wire fence. None of them got over, but Mark knew exactly how to scale such a fence because his father once taught him how it could be done. Mark then hotwired a car, hit the road, and settled into a motel for the night. This was his problem. He understood the technical aspects related to escape, but he didn't have the noose, the worldliness, the social intellect to evade the authorities for long. He got six more charges after that. He went back to jail, where he was jumped by 14 inmates who didn't quite understand this weird kid who didn't fit in but wasn't afraid to talk back to them. Those 14 so-called tough guys beat him badly and sexually abused him. After that, Mark slid his wrists. He hit his head against the cell door. He screamed and shouted all day long, and soon he was taken to that psych ward where he would spike a coffee pot with an entire bottle of LSD. The prison system and the justice system thought that what they had was an unruly kid who'd been lucky to get over a razor wire fence. They didn't much like the inmate. He was troublesome, he used bad language, and he would often not do as he was told. For that, over the years, Mark would be beaten time and again by the guards. He had to escape, that's all he ever thought about. You have to see, in his mind, a mind that worked differently from most people's, he'd only taken his father's tools, and those tools had been given to him. The escapes, to Mark's reasoning, were not crimes, but the right thing to do. He was, in fact, just being very rational. Tools equal mine, imprisonment equals wrong, escape equals right. One day, he was asked if he'd like to join a new woodwork and arts crafts activity. Of course he would. This was a guy that was brilliant at making things, but when Mark saw rolled up copper sheets, the first thing that came to his mind was, they really mustn't want me to stay. That's because what he saw in the workshop were all the necessary bits and pieces to fashion a homemade gun, aka a zip gun. With the copper, he made the gun barrel and then he fixed that to a homemade pistol grip. When he had the gun ready, the next thing he did was steal an ice pick and take that back to his cell. He took that spike and ripped out one of his back teeth. With blood streaming from his mouth, he called a nurse and he was rushed to the psych ward prison hospital, albeit in handcuffs and leg chains. The dentist knew right away that this was an act of self-mutilation, and that's what he added to his report. After seeing the dentist, Mark asked if he could go for a pee. In the bathroom, he picked his locks again and produced his homemade gun. Pointing his zip gun at the guards, he shouted, anybody move and I'll blow your brains out. Some inmates in that ward, perhaps not in good mental shape, started jumping around and screaming. Mark shot a table just to prove to them his gun actually worked. After that, he was gone again, out the door and running through the nearby woods. But again, he just didn't quite know how to stay out. He stole yet another car but was soon caught. He was now making the headlines of local news media, but the prison system, they were starting to get pretty mad at the kid. He'd had his chances, now they wanted him to suffer. And suffer he did, in jail, while the authorities tried to figure out if this kid was mentally fit to stand trial. They kept him locked down for 24 hours a day. Was he fit to stand trial? Four psychiatrists said no. No way, he's mentally ill, this man doesn't know what's right or wrong. Sure, he understands the court system and he's not raving mad, in fact, he's obviously very talented, but still, he doesn't know why he's here at all. He should not stand trial. One man said that wasn't the case, calling Mark a malingerer, meaning someone pretending to be mentally unwell. That same man decades later changed his mind. That didn't help the 20-year-old Mark who was sent back to jail. There he made another gun, an improved version of his last zip gun, even though for this one he had to use an empty roll of toothpaste. I was in my gunsmith phase, I could make a gun out of anything, Mark would later recall. This time he threatened the guards, and just to make sure the gun was working, he fired it at a wall. It was working alright, and many other inmates saw that Mark had not shot anywhere near the guards. But enough was enough. The guards beat Mark within an inch of his life and forced him into a pitch black cell, naked, bruised, and broken. After 11 days of that, he took a plea deal without really knowing what a plea deal was. For firing at the wall, he was convicted of attempted murder. Later, he was sent to the Florida State Prison, a prison that at the time was said to be totally ungovernable, a prison where violence and murder was commonplace. No inmate in the US ever wanted to end up there. It confined the so-called worst of the worst, but as prisons go, it was the worst of the worst. Mark was still occasionally unruly. He still didn't really understand the prison system or the prison code, and he was beaten severely by both guards and inmates on many occasions. 
and so he started making homemade weapons. When they were found, he went back into the hole. His solitary confinement was often a life of total isolation. The order given by the prison authorities was no clothes for the prisoner, no mattress or sheets. Conversation with anyone was prohibited, which included prison trustees. He was given no toiletries, no tissues, no toothpaste, no soap. They turned off the water in his cell at times and he couldn't even flush the toilet. He had to eat with his hands and in the total darkness. The torture and humiliation was later compared to what happened at Guantanamo Bay. He had to live in silence and darkness, naked, like a trapped animal. And if that's not cruel and unusual punishment, then what is? His punishment was nothing short of medieval, in arguably a form of modern day torture. The prison put him on a consolidated security list, so when he wasn't in total darkness, he still wasn't allowed out of his cell. In his own words, he said, you can go two, three, four, five, six, seven years without ever seeing the yard. In total, he had 10 years of requests to see the sun, and they were all denied. But he still caught sight of the guards, and what he would do is study their keys. After examining them, he'd memorize the cuts in the keys and then make his own set out of paper. I made keys for every lock in America, he said many years later. Did he ever get to use them? Well, Mark attempted to escape 13 times in all, and he was successful 7 times. One time he scaled the fence and broke both his feet. He somehow managed to hotwire a truck, ram a police roadblock, and then after a high-speed chase, ended up driving the truck into someone's living room. They were really upset, he later said about the people whose house he'd driven into. He had hundreds of disciplinary reports, but he's never hurt anyone else. They were usually for minor infractions, or for being found with weapons he was keeping to protect himself in the ultra-violent places where he was housed. His story became public, and the majority of the public now say that this is a man who has some mental issues who's been chewed up by the prison system right from the first year when he was brutally beaten and sexually abused by a gang of inmates. He was paroled on February 5, 2019 on the condition that he spent a year in a mental health and substance abuse center. Over the years, he developed dependencies on the many drugs he received in prison. After only a few days, he started showing signs of bipolar mania, and his kidneys were failing him. He also tested positive for methamphetamine. Mark was subsequently sent back to jail, and from what we can now see, he is waiting to see which prison he'll be sent to. It's now 40 years since he drove off with his deceased father's tools. 27 of those years, he spent in solitary confinement either with the absence of the sun or in total darkness. There seems to be some disagreement as to who has spent the most time in solitary confinement, but you can find a handful of people that did over 40 years without much contact with other people. The record might well be smashed by the British prisoner called Robert Maudsley, aka the Brain Eater or the real-life Hannibal the Cannibal, who's now done over 40 years in solitary. The man we're going to talk about today might be behind in terms of years spent kept away from the other prison population, but there's another reason he's called the most isolated prisoner in the world. Mr. Silverstein, who was born in 1952, has been in prison since 1977. Back then, he was convicted of armed robbery and sent to the United States Penitentiary in Leavenworth, Kansas to do his time. You might be curious why armed robbery with no deaths would warrant such a long sentence, but it's what Tommy did inside the prison that made the difference. He has been given the epithet America's most dangerous prisoner, and while the media is prone to exaggeration at times, he certainly has been very dangerous within the confines of US prisons. During his time behind bars, he's been convicted of killing four people, although one of those convictions was overturned. For that, he was later given a specially designed solitary cell, and one that he would have to spend 24 hours a day in, seven days a week. According to blog posts written not long before we started writing this show, Silverstein had some very serious health complications, but we're told that the Bureau of Prisons will not release any information as to his condition. He was put into intensive care, although we're told not even his family were allowed to visit him. This is how isolated this prisoner is, and we should add that by the time you watch this show, there might not even be a Tommy Silverstein. But now let's look at how he got into this point in his life. We're told that Tommy grew up in Long Beach, California. While pregnant with him, his mother got a divorce, though she then married again. Silverstein claims that the second man is his real father. He wasn't around that long anyway because his mother divorced again and married a Mr. Silverstein. And this man legally adopted the young Tommy. From what we can see, he didn't exactly come from the wrong side of the tracks. It's said he lived a middle class kind of life, but was very shy and certainly not a tough kid at the start. He was bullied for various reasons, but it's written that because of his name, the other kids used to pick on him for being Jewish in a neighborhood where there weren't many Jewish people. It's said he soon toughened up and fought back, with Silverstein saying his mother didn't suffer fools or bullies gladly. 
Most bio websites post this comment that Silverstein once made about his childhood. That's how my mom was. She stood her mud. If someone came at you with a bat, you got your bat and you both went at it. So it seems he was a slightly troubled kid, but he didn't get into serious trouble until he was 19 years old. That's when he was arrested for armed robbery the first time. He was sent to San Quentin and served four years. Not long after getting out, he met his father, the real one that he says is his biological father, and also his uncle. The three were eventually arrested for three armed robberies. It seemed Silverstein being so young garnered some sympathy, with those people saying the young man had been taken in by the older men. The judge wasn't buying any of that lack of parental guidance stuff though and sentenced Tommy to 15 years. He wouldn't get out of prison again and might never if his present sickness gets the better of him. Even if he survives that, it's very unlikely he'll ever get out of prison again. It's said his release date is officially 2095, so if he makes it to 143, he might feel the wind on his back again. While in prison in Kansas, he developed a friendship with members of the Aryan Brotherhood. In 1980, Tommy, now 28, was convicted of killing a fellow inmate. The story goes that the inmate had turned down an offer he couldn't refuse. That was to be a drug mule for the white gang. This is what the TV show Crime Investigation had to say. As an inductee of the Aryan Brotherhood, Terrible Tom happily committed acts of violence, which soon escalated to murder. He violently killed DC Black's gang member Danny Atwell. We should say though that his conviction was overturned with some of the witnesses later charged with lying in court. Silverstein was then sent to the United States Penitentiary in Marion, Illinois, which was said to be a very tough prison. Silverstein had been given a life sentence for that murder, but obviously that had been reversed after the perjury charge. But then he was accused of killing another DC Blacks member, Robert Chappelle. Silverstein always denied this, and then the Bureau of Prisons did something one could call worthy of redress. They moved the nationwide leader of the DC Blacks, Raymond Cadillac Smith, to Marion while Silverstein was on trial for Chappelle's murder. I tried to tell Cadillac that I didn't kill Chappelle, but he didn't believe me and he bragged that he was going to kill me, Silverstein would later say. He added that no one tried to keep the men apart, and it was believed by him and the other prisoners that the guards wanted one of the men to kill the other. A more cynical person would say that the system wanted one less violent inmate. The one less they eventually got was Cadillac, who was stabbed 67 times by Silverstein. He did this with another member of the Aryan Brotherhood called Clayton Fountain. Crime Investigation writes that Silverstein walked up and down the wing with the dead body to show the others what might happen if they decided to try and take him out. We are told after this he became one of the top guys in the Aryan Brotherhood. He was also given another life sentence. So now we bring in an officer called Merle Eugene Klutz. He was supposed to maintain order in the violent wing of the prison, but Silverstein has always maintained that Klutz came in with a very heavy hand. He was there to especially watch Silverstein, and the latter said that he didn't only watch him, but regularly tormented him. That culminated with the death of Klutz. One day in 1983, he and other guards were taking Silverstein to the shower block. On the way, with the help of another prisoner, Silverstein got out of his handcuffs with a homemade key and stabbed the officer with a shank or a homemade weapon that he'd been handed. The autopsy report revealed that Silverstein stabbed Klutz around 40 times. Silverstein has always said he did this because Klutz had treated him particularly badly, even for prison. An investigation revealed that wasn't the case, but Silverstein said the investigation itself was corrupt. He was transferred to a different prison at this time where he murdered another guard. What followed was a 23-year lockdown at Marion. Some say these two incidents were the reason the first Supermax prison was built in the US. You might guess that this was the beginning of Silverstein's days in solitary. It wasn't normal solitary though, it was what's called total isolation. That means 24 hours a day in the cell and lights are on all the time. His security status was no human contact. Not many prisoners get this, with Silverstein and the British maniac we mentioned at the start of the show being the most notorious. Advocates of human rights have said such isolation is not far from a torture technique used by the military and sometimes extremists called whitewashing. Gradually the BOP started giving Silverstein books and a TV. But skeptics say this only happened because the Bureau realized that in order to really punish someone in prison, the prisoner can't just have nothing. You need to give him something and then take it away. This is the torture 101 style we see in the movies, such as Silence of the Lambs when Dr. Lecter has his books taken away. We should add that his self-contained cell is a bit bigger than usual cells. For one thing, it has to have a shower as he can't go to the shower room. 
We've seen plenty of sketches online that Tommy himself drew of his cell. We might also add that Silverstein didn't hate all guards. In the now famous case, one part of a prison was overtaken by Cuban rioters in 1987. Silverstein was let out of his cell, and he could go anywhere he liked for a short time. The Cubans held guards hostage, and so the authorities were concerned that Silverstein would hurt or even kill them. One of the guards had known Silverstein for a long time, but no bad came to him. It said he had always been kind to the prisoner, asking him on occasions if his handcuffs were too tight. Still, Silverstein said some of the guards would torment him often. In fact, you can read a blog that includes a note written by Silverstein that must have been written just before he fell ill. There he talks about deprivation, saying, Dear friends and supporters, as I've noted for decades with each new warden administration that they rotate every three years or so, usually takes away from what we've got instead of gives us more. He adds, They gotta flex their muscles as cowards do with the hopeless and helpless. In the last paragraph, he talks about what his solitary confinement is like, saying, Like the monotone bars and walls that entomb me, they've stamped out the colors of happiness that I enjoy sharing with the outside world enforcing a black and white existence in this colorless hole of madness. Other blog posts written by friends of Silverstein tell us that his writing and art have been confiscated at times, and getting anything creative out of prison has been hard. We found a lot more of Tommy's thoughts that have been published on blogs. He writes in other posts that, unlike even the worst case of confinement, he can't even shout across a corridor. His isolation is what you might call extreme solitude. He writes that things have happened to him that have never been reported, and he adds that inside the prison walls things go on that seldom make it onto those prison TV shows. For him, the penal system is unjust. The prison system in general is not about rehabilitation for the most part, he believes. As for solitary, he writes, history and studies clearly show that solitary confinement does more harm than good, that it reveals the idiocy and sadistic mentality of prison administrators who embrace this barbaric medieval practice, and that it is a crime against humanity. The guards didn't see it that way, with one prison official once telling an author, we can't execute Silverstein, so we have no choice but to make his life a living hell. Otherwise, inmates will kill guards too. There has to be some supreme punishment. We should add that Silverstein does get to visit people now and again, but never in close quarters and always with glass and a telephone. One visitor recently wrote, he was told there were certain things he was not allowed to discuss with me, one being the book he is writing. Tom talked about his desire to further his education. I had no idea there's no longer funding for prisoners to study. Picture this, you're 22 years old, in the prime of your life, with a pregnant and devoted wife you haven't been married to for very long. And then everything changes one night when a man is murdered in the street. You are accused of the murder, with the evidence being that it was your face a witness saw running from the scene of the crime. That evidence is weak, to say the least. And seeing as you know very well you didn't do it, you're confident you'll get off. But that's not the case, and you will spend many years behind bars. A trial judge will say you're likely innocent some 20 years after the crime was committed, and you still won't get out. How could this happen? Let's start from the beginning. The man we're talking about is named Benjamin Spencer, and he was convicted along with another man of committing a murder on a quiet street in West Dallas over 30 years ago. On March 22nd in the year of 1987, a 33-year-old named Jeffrey Young, who was doing well for himself at a clothing company, was attacked after walking out of his company office around 9.30 p.m. The police report says he was then manhandled into his BMW by two men and drove over to West Dallas, and it's there his body was dumped down a dark alley. Police thought they had gotten lucky when witnesses came forward and said that they saw what happened. There were three of those witnesses and they identified two men. One was Spencer and the other was named Robert Mitchell. But as the district attorney of Dallas now says, something might have been amiss because all the witnesses all knew Spencer. These people were not strangers. Spencer was by no means an angel. He'd spent some time behind bars before for driving on a suspended license and had also been put on probation for six years for driving a car that had been stolen by a friend. Nonetheless, as we said, his new wife was pregnant and he was turning over a new leaf. After he was picked up four days after the crime, he wasn't very worried. It was just a mistake, a case of mistaken identity, but that wasn't the case at all. Spencer had an alibi too, which was the testimony of a young woman friend of his who said she'd been hanging out with him when the murder and robbery took place. On top of that, there was no physical evidence linking Spencer to the crime, just those witness testimonies. During the robbery, a watch had been stolen, as well as a wedding ring, a small portable TV, and a briefcase. None of these things were found at Spencer's house. Police didn't have any fingerprint evidence, nor was there a murder weapon found. 
Many years later, Spencer would say in an interview, I began to think, well, I didn't commit this offense, the truth is going to come out. But a few months down the line, Spencer was sentenced to 35 years in prison, with the evidence being the witness's testimony as well as a jailhouse informant's testimony. It was a nightmare come true. Spencer's heart sank. His life was ruined. The father-to-be had become a condemned man and the state had failed to do its job in his eyes. But not long into his sentence, Spencer got a break. It turned out that the star witness in his case had lied. She would not told the truth about whether she had received a reward for coming forward and giving evidence. A new trial was set, but Spencer was then offered a plea deal by the state. He could probably get out in five years if he accepted this. But wasn't this five years too much? And why would an innocent man taint his name by admitting he killed someone when he had it? In his mind, he'd been wronged, and accepting a plea deal was just another wrong in the topsy-turvy world of American justice. Nonetheless, his attorney told him to take it. Years later, Spencer would tell NPR, he was saying, if you take it to trial, they're going to give you a life sentence, and they're likely to get it. And I'm like, I'm not going to plead guilty to something I didn't do. Who in their right mind would? And so he didn't accept the deal. During his second trial, the state prosecuted Spencer for aggravated robbery and asked for a life sentence. The evidence, again, was a witness testimony, with the star witness being a 42-year-old woman who lived close to the alley where the victim was dumped. It was her testimony that got Spencer convicted again. And as you'll soon find out, her testimony was hardly concrete, but she stood her ground and, according to reports, was very convincing when she described what she had seen on the night of the crime. This was Spencer and Mitchell dumping the body. Mitchell was also convicted again, and unfortunately he would not live much longer anyway. So now Spencer is back in prison again, looking down a long road of 30-something years living life behind bars as an innocent man. His life now would be dedicated to proving his innocence, and this would be a long process. Spencer got in touch with organizations that helped wrongly convicted men who were serving time. One such organization was named Centurion Ministries, and the people there knew that the state had sent down an innocent man. They built a case, interviewed over a hundred people, and then asked for a hearing. The petition ended up on the desk of a criminal court judge in Dallas named Rick Magnus. He said he wasn't sure at first whether to have a hearing, mostly because the exoneration wasn't based on any kind of new DNA evidence. This is often what gets innocent people free. But he later said in interviews that the more he read about the case, he realized there had been a lot of wrongs in Spencer's conviction. Twenty years after the crime, Magnus granted an evidentiary hearing. The witnesses came forward again, and this time two of them backed down. But that woman who lived across from the alley didn't. She stood firm again. She said she had definitely seen Spencer. As we said, there was a big problem with her testimony. That's because all those years later, a forensic visual scientist was asked to watch a reenactment of the body being dumped. What that was, was people in the dark pretending to be the pair that dumped the body. After this, there was no doubt that this woman could have seen anything other than a silhouette. No way she could have clearly seen a face as she said she had done. That forensic scientist said with the conditions as they were, a person could not have made out a face any farther than 25 feet away. But as it stood, the witness claiming to have seen the man who was standing closest to the crime scene was 93 feet away. Again, just no way could any of those witnesses have got a clear ID. With this new evidence, Judge Magnus said, OK, enough is enough, and he ordered a retrial on the grounds of something called actual innocence. As for Spencer, he said he was over the moon when he heard the news. Not only would he get out, but he would clear his name, too. In an interview, he said, I was very hopeful. I thought that this is it. I'm going home. That didn't happen, though. Spencer said at first he was hopeful that his retrial would take place within a few weeks. They passed, so then he thought maybe a few months, and they passed. In fact, years passed, and the only authority capable of granting a new trial, the Court of Criminal Appeals, it seems, did nothing at all. Then in 2011, Spencer got some bad news. There would be no retrial. While a judge said that, indeed, if the new evidence had been presented at the first trial, it would have been unlikely that Spencer would have been convicted. But that same judge said because Spencer hadn't come up with any incontrovertible new evidence proving he wasn't there that night, such as CCTV footage or DNA that had never been tested, there would be no trial. The judge admitted that Spencer was likely innocent, but it didn't matter. He didn't have the evidence to get that new trial. His attorney now says that she needs to start again. She needs to find this new evidence proving her client's innocence. The problem, of course, is how do you find new evidence 28 years after the fact? 
The woman across from the alley now won't talk openly about the case. Another witness died, and another now says that she didn't get a clear look at Spencer. The witness now says he felt pressured by the police to say it was Spencer. So that's it. The only thing saying Spencer is guilty is the testimony of a witness who it's been proven couldn't have possibly seen Spencer that night. Everyone seems to know the case stinks, but the fact is the justice system doesn't seem to provide any solutions to get Spencer out. But there's more. There was another witness, but this witness was never called. She now says that she is 1000% sure that the people she saw didn't include Spencer. What about that jailhouse informant? Well, he now says that Spencer never told him he had committed the crime. Records also show something very fishy. The informant said in court that he had not received any benefit from giving that statement. But this guy was looking at a 25-year sentence for aggravated robbery. Guess what happened after he spoke to the police and gave his testimony? He walked out of prison after just more than a year. Another person has come forward saying he knows who killed the man that night because it was a friend of his who did it. He admitted it to him. This man did not come forward at the time because he didn't want to rat on one of his friends. The man whose name was put forward is currently serving time for robbery and assault. Investigators now say that police weren't going after Spencer, but they just had a case of what's called tunnel vision. They had a theory and they looked only at the evidence that fit that theory, anything else was ignored. Spencer now sits in his cell, a man in his 50s wearing glasses, waiting and hoping, but he doesn't have too much hope left. In an interview, he said, I'm just at a point where I'm still hopeful, but at the same time, it's like I'm stuck in the system. His story has been written about extensively in the American media, but it seems this man really is stuck in the system. He's been denied parole on each occasion he was up for it, and from what we can see, still waits in his cell to this day, waiting in vain for something to help him get him out of the web of American justice. The rat-a-tat-tat of the drums lures people to follow the prisoner cart, slowly rolling through the streets of Sydney. Two condemned men are going to be executed this morning, thief James Hardwick and 23-year-old thief and murderer Joseph Samuel. By the time the cart reaches the gallows near Brickfield Hill, a large crowd is gathered. They don't yet know that they're about to witness something unusual and that the events of the day will long be remembered. Reverend Samuel Marsden administers last rites to Hardwick. An elder of the Jewish community, Joseph Marcus, who would later become Australia's first rabbi, performs rites for Samuel. Then the men are asked if they wish to confess. Samuel pleads his case, pointing out a man in the crowd, Isaac Simmons, as the real killer. Some people in the crowd are riled up after Samuel's impassioned speech, but the execution continues. At 10 a.m., Samuel and Hardwick step up onto the cart and have nooses placed around their necks. Here's where accounts differ. Some say that Hardwick received a last-minute pardon and Samuel was left to face his maker alone. Others claim that Hardwick was indeed executed and due to a bizarre twist of fate, he was the only one executed on this day. Either way, standing on the cart seconds from death, a terrified Samuel begins to quietly pray. The executioner slaps the horse's rump, the horse trots forward, and the cart pulls out from beneath Samuel's feet. In 1795, at age 15, Joseph Samuel was sentenced to seven years of imprisonment for larceny in England. In 1801, he was transported to Australia to serve out the remainder of his sentence. Samuel was imprisoned in the penal settlement at Sydney Cove in the colony of New South Wales. In addition to the harsh security of the prison camp, it was purposely miles from out of town. The guards figured that if a man was able to escape, the hostile outback would take care of him before he could make his way back to civilization. However, Samuel did escape and survive. Eventually, he made it to Sydney and took up with a gang of thieves. On the night of August 25, 1803, they robbed the home of a wealthy woman, Mrs. Mary Breeze. Among other items, they stole 24 guineas and several silver dollars. A constable on patrol in the area, Joseph Lucker, investigated. The next morning, Constable Lucker was found stabbed to death becoming the first police officer killed in the line of duty in Australia. The gang of thieves was quickly hunted down and captured. Samuel had some of the stolen coins in his pocket when he was arrested. Also, Mrs. Breeze identified him as one of the culprits. When interrogated, Samuel confessed to the robbery but claimed to have nothing to do with the murder. Still, he was tried and convicted. The other suspects were banished from the colonies or acquitted. Even though they were caught with blood on their clothes, two other suspects, Isaac Simmons and William Bladders, were acquitted due to insufficient evidence and their explanations. Simmons claimed that he was prone to nosebleeds and Bladder said he had recently slaughtered a pig. The morning of the execution, Simmons was escorted by police to watch the hanging, in the hopes that he would be frightened enough to confess. At the time in Australia, death by hanging was brutal. 
the more merciful drop hanging where a convict drops through a hole and their neck is quickly snapped hadn't yet been instituted. Instead, a condemned person stands on a cart. Once the noose is placed around their neck, the horse would pull away with the cart. Thus, the condemned would be left dangling and slowly strangled to death. As Samuels gets up on the cart, he's scared. His accusation of Isaac Simmons has angered some in the crowd, but not stopped the proceedings as he'd hoped. Samuel prays as a noose is slid around his neck. The executioner slaps the horse's rump. The horse trots forward and the cart pulls out from beneath Samuel's feet. He painfully dangles for a moment, and then the rope around Samuel's neck inexplicably breaks, causing him to drop to the ground, spraining his ankle. Another rope is brought, and for a second time Samuel stands on the cart. Again a noose is placed around his neck. And this time, when the horse pulls the cart away, the noose unravels, extending the rope enough to allow Samuel's boots to touch the ground. By now, the crowd is uneasy. Not only has this man passionately proclaimed his innocence, but mysteriously, twice now, the executioner has failed to kill him. Some people shout for Samuels to be released, claiming that divine intervention is saving him. Nevertheless, a third rope is fetched. This time, the authorities quickly inspect the rope before making a noose. It's a standard rope made of five thick cords of hemp. It should be able to hold around a thousand pounds without breaking. For the third time, Samuel is placed on the cart, a noose around his neck. The horse is slapped and pulls the cart away. Incredibly, the rope breaks again. Samuel falls face first into the ground and is briefly knocked unconscious. By now, the crowd is rowdy. They clamor for Samuel to be released. The provost marshal orders the execution to be delayed and gallops off on horseback to report the unbelievable series of events to Governor King. He comes back with a stay of execution. The governor has granted Samuel a reprieve. You would think that after his crazy brush with death, Samuel might straighten up and become a model citizen. But no, he didn't. Samuel was taken to the doctor for injuries received during the botched execution. He fully recovered. His sentence was converted to life in prison, and he was sent to Kingstown, which later became Newcastle, to work in the coal mines. In 1806, Samuel and seven other men escaped the settlement, sailing off in a boat during a storm. They were never heard from again. All were presumed lost at sea. Isaac Simmons was convicted and hung for the murder of Constable Lucker. However, today Constable Lucker's murder is considered to be Australia's oldest cold case with no definitive proof as to the murderer. You did the crime, and now you're going to do the time. You're shipping up to the big house, to the clink, to lock up city. But you could actually end up in two completely separate places, both with different sets of rules. Today we're asking jail versus prison. What's the difference? First, we'll start with jail, since if you were forced to choose, this is definitely the one you want to get sent to. Typically, this is what's known as the clink, with prison being known as the big house. Jails are normally much smaller facilities that hold a smaller number of inmates than prisons, which can have populations of several thousand. They're typically run by local governments, think city versus the state, and supervised by a county sheriff's department. Their population is mostly made up of people who have been recently arrested for minor offenses or a misdemeanor and their sentences are far shorter than in prison, typically less than a year. Yet jails are themselves different from the temporary lockups which are typically located inside police departments and hold individuals who can't post bail, those arrested for public drunkenness or individuals waiting to be processed into a jail. Jails can also serve to hold prisoners awaiting trial or to hold a prisoner during a very long and extended trial. While they typically only hold individuals guilty of misdemeanors, if the sentences for several misdemeanors are not served concurrently, then an individual could be held for far longer than the typical period of less than a year. However, jails often offer work release programs, boot camps, educational programs, substance abuse support groups, and vocational training programs. Prisons, however, are a vastly different world than jails, and this is where the most hardened criminals are sent to. You'll find no misdemeanors here, and instead, prisons hold men who have been convicted of felonies. If you're wondering the difference between felonies and misdemeanors, misdemeanors include offenses such as petty theft, prostitution, simple assault, trespassing, vandalism, and reckless driving. Felonies, on the other hand, include crimes such as assault with a deadly weapon, grand theft, rape, and murder. If you had to pick which of the two populations to spend a year or more with, we're pretty sure you'd want to go with the misdemeanor crowd. While jails are run by local governments, prisons are run by the state or even the federal government, who has its own prison system apart from that of the state government-run prisons. The difference between the two types of prisons is pretty obvious. State prisons hold individuals who break state laws, and federal prisons hold individuals guilty of breaking federal laws. 
The difference between the two offenses can be a bit murky though, and federal prisoners can range from individuals who rob banks because banks are insured by the federal government to people accused of political crimes, and many white-collar criminals. For these reasons, state prisons are often much more dangerous than federal prisons, as they hold many more violent offenders. If you plan on breaking the law, then make sure it's a federal law and not a state law for a much safer prison experience. Both federal and state prisons range from minimum security to maximum security though, and the degree of the offense determines where you will end up. Many white collar crimes such as tax evasion can net you a stay in a federal minimum security prison. Here you'll enjoy many amenities including team sports and a dining facility, with few guards and typically just a single fence. Minimum security prisons tend to resemble adult camps more than actual prisons, and some even have internet access for their prisoners. Visits with family are common, and violence is exceptionally rare. You'll also be able to enjoy a dorm instead of a cell, and overall your stay will resemble something more like a college dorm than an actual prison. Offenders here typically have non-violent convictions and clean prior criminal records, though some can be prisoners who have been transferred from higher security prisons thanks to exemplary behavior. Medium security prisons are what you probably think of when you think of prison, and though the inmates do enjoy some degree of independence, their movements are all very tightly controlled. You can forget things such as team sports or internet access, though some prisons may offer use of library computers as incentives to well-behaved individuals. Medium security prisons also don't have cells, and instead have spanning dormitories that house dozens of inmates together. Orange is the New Black is a good example of a medium security prison facility. Maximum security prison, or supermaxes, is where the worst of the worst go. Yet this is where the least of all prisoners in the US serve their time. These places are inhabited by inmates with very violent offenses or those who have caused trouble in lower security prisons, earning them a trip to a much more restrictive life. Inmates who have tried to escape or successfully escaped and then been caught are also automatically sent to a maximum security prison so their movements can be very closely monitored. Unsurprisingly, an inmate's daily life is extremely restricted in a supermax, and headcounts are common. Prisoners typically share a small cell with another prisoner and may get some freedom to move about the cells during the daytime, but must always be ready for headcounts by lights out. Prisoners also enjoy cafeteria meals and time spent on recreation out in the yard, where they can do things like play basketball or lift weights. While gang activity permeates the entire prison system and even jails, it's in maximum security prison where it's at its peak. And along with the restrictions imposed by the prison system, inmates live under a code of conduct further restricted by the gangs they join. Not joining a gang is possible, but typically hazardous to your health. Inside a maximum security prison, you can also find solitary lockup, which is where the worst of the worst end up doing much of their time. Here offenders who trespass while serving time in prison will get sent as a punishment, and though most stays last only a few weeks, they can end up serving as much as years in solitary. Offenses such as assaulting a guard will not only get you more prison time but earn you several months or more in solitary, where you'll spend your entire day cramped up in a tiny cell with one hour of outside recreation a day. During that hour, you'll be allowed to sit in a small fenced-in outdoor area that's typically a few paces long by a few paces wide, though often you may not be allowed outside as short-staffed prisons simply can't spare the manpower to get you your hour of rec. Other times, guards may simply deny you your hour as a punishment measure. Between the two, you definitely want to serve your time in jail if you can, or at least in a minimum security prison where you'll enjoy many of the perks of what basically amounts to an adult camp. End up in a medium or maximum security prison though, and not only are you going to be there a long time, but your stay is going to be much more difficult and much more uncomfortable. It's the early 1990s and the world's biggest drug kingpin, who's also one of the world's richest people, is sitting back in his jacuzzi. He has a glass of champagne to one side of him and a meal to the other side that was put together by one of his personal chefs. He's in a good mood since his favorite soccer team, Atletico Nacional, is winning 3-0. While this is going on, tons of his cocaine are being snorted and transported all over the world. Looking through a window, he sees the usual evening fog start to encapsulate his mountain fortress. He's safe and sound, and living a life of love luxury, and yet he's officially in prison. Pablo Escobar, aka the King of Coke or to his allies El Patron, doesn't need much of an introduction. He became the richest criminal in the world with a fortune amounting to as much as $30 billion. One of the reasons many of you will know a lot about this man's life story is because in death he's also made a lot of money for Netflix. Perhaps no other criminal has featured in movies and series as much as Pablo has done over the last decade. He started his life of crime in his teen years, selling fake high school diplomas 
He soon moved into moving fake lottery tickets, stealing cars and other petty crimes. But it was smuggling that would make him a millionaire as a young man. Let's first see how cocaine consumption got going in the US. Pablo Escobar's most faithful customer. Cocaine had actually been consumed in the USA and Europe a long time before Pablo came on the scene. In 1884, an Austrian neurologist who became the founder of psychoanalysis said cocaine was a magical substance. He was, of course, Sigmund Freud, and he struggled to quit taking the stuff in his later years. The US Food and Drug Act of 1906 ensured that if cocaine was added to certain products, then that should be on the label. You might remember that Coca-Cola famously added it to its secret recipe from 1899 to 1903. No doubt Coke drinkers also agreed that the drink was pretty magical. The creator of Coca-Cola, John Pemberton, actually devised the coca leaf infused drink as a way to deal with his own morphine addiction. In 1914, the Harrison Narcotics Tax Act came into effect. This regulated the sale of cocaine and other narcotics. The stimulant had been around on the streets for a long time before that, but used mainly on the fringes of society. It was used by some poor folks who required the extra push for the hard work they did. The drug was stigmatized, and outlandish, racist, and ridiculous things were said about the minorities and working classes that allegedly took the stuff. This is a long way from Escobar's high castle. We just want you to know that a long time before 21st century news reports told us that 90% of US banknotes contained traces of cocaine, it existed on the fringes of society. By by the time the 1950s rolled around in the USA, cocaine was thought to be a thing of the past, a substance still associated with poorer folks. According to a research article called The Pre-Columbian Era of Drug Trafficking in the Americas, Cocaine 1945-1965, in the 1950s very few smugglers brought the drug to the USA from various parts of South America. In the 1960s, things changed. And in 1969, when the Beatles released Abbey Road, and many Americans experienced three days of peace and music at the Woodstock Festival, the 20-year-old Pablo Escobar was about to embark on a career smuggling cocaine to the USA. Fast forward a few years and cocaine had been redefined as a party drug and associated with wealth and glamorous discos. It was no longer a pick-me-up for a farm laborer. Cocaine had made a comeback, and Pablo Escobar was behind it. In the mid-70s, when Americans were doing lines in restroom stalls, he had already banked around $3 million. His operations got bigger. He devised more smuggling routes and brought in more airplanes. And in the 1980s, the US was flooded with cocaine. Wall Street brokers couldn't get through a morning without a straightener, and it wouldn't be long until the drug had infiltrated many, many neighborhoods in the US. Now Pablo is a billionaire. He's thought of as a Robin Hood to the poor communities he helps in Colombia, and there aren't many officials he doesn't have in his pockets. Then, a man named Luis Carlos Galan comes into the political scene in Colombia, and he wants to win the 1990 presidential election. He wants to clean things up and get rid of corruption. And of course, he has an extreme dislike of Escobar's Medellin cartel. The US wanted Escobar extradited to face the music there, and Galan supported this. This was bad news for Pablo, and it wasn't long until Galan was assassinated. One of the cartel's hitmen, John Jairo Velasquez, aka Popeye, has since stated that Pablo was behind that. We should also remember that the cartel still had many paid friends in politics and the military, and Galan, being president, would have put a dent in their under-the-table paychecks. The thing was, Escobar and his cartel had just gotten out of hand. There had been too much blood on the streets, and taking Galan out was seen as perhaps having too much power. There was also a lot of pressure from the USA. A new government came in, and under the Colombian Constitution of 1991, the extradition of Colombians to the US was not allowed. This part of the Constitution was no doubt ghostwritten by Escobar. Knowing that he couldn't be sent to the US for a lifelong stay in an isolated cell, Escobar made a deal with the Colombian government. He gave himself up and agreed to spend five years in prison, only there was a catch. He would design the prison himself and be guarded by people he wanted to guard him. This could only happen after handshakes with some corrupt officials in the Colombian government. What Escobar had in mind was not exactly four walls, a cement bed, and a steel basin. It was, in fact, quite the opposite. What he envisioned for his confinement was more like an opulent palace, replete with all modern conveniences. This is why the place has been called Hotel Escobar, or Club Medellin. At the same time, his communications with the outside world weren't to be affected by his confinement. So in a way, all that happened is he was being guarded from his enemies rather than being kept in. Escobar was well aware that a lot of people wanted him dead, so the location of his hotel prison was on a mountaintop. He'd chosen this location after a scouting trip with his brother. From there, he could see anyone approaching, and the place had telescopes for long-distance surveillance. It was not an easy place to travel to, and any enemy coming to get him would have had difficulties trying to navigate that mountain terrain. 
The area was also covered in fog much of the day, which would make an air assault very difficult. Suffice it to say, the prison was armed like a fortress and included a large building that contained weapons and ammunition. Escobar's hotel might not have looked too luxurious from the outside. After all, he had to keep up the appearance that he was being detained. It was surrounded by high walls and barbed wire fences. Once he got over those walls, though, things were a little different. Escobar was a big fan of soccer, so of course, he had a soccer field where he and his men could have a kickabout. It was a quality pitch, too, and at one point, Escobar even invited the Colombian national team to have a game there. According to hitman Popeye, on one occasion all 22 players for the national team of 1991 actually did make the trip up the mountain, even though they required some off-road vehicles to get there. First, they enjoyed a lunch fit for kings, and after that, Escobar donned a pair of his best cleats and they grabbed hold of a ball. The slightly overweight Escobar wasn't exactly in the same league as those guys, but they played along with him. He wasn't the kind of man a player would want to slide tackle. The prison guard served refreshments from the sidelines, and after the game, those same guards served drinks to Escobar and players as they partied in the disco. As for the interior of the residence, it had to be luxurious enough so that he could host parties there and people could sleep over in the rooms befitting a five-star hotel. The kitchen was grand, like that of a large hotel, which had all the state-of-the-art appliances. Escobar had his 42nd birthday up there and he was in a mood to celebrate. He put on an elaborate dinner that was cooked by chefs that had come from some of the finest restaurants in Medellin. Escobar loved his food, especially after he'd had a few drinks and smoked some of his beloved weed. For his party, his family and many of his closest friends were invited. On the menu that evening was turkey, smoked salmon, smoked trout, and caviar. Some of the rooms were what you might call party rooms, so people could play billiards or watch sports on the largest TV screens of the day. There was a larger space where you could party all night long, dancing under disco lights. The dance floor had a rotating disc in the middle, so men could dance around the models Escobar occasionally invited up to his hotel in the clouds. When models weren't available, he would invite escorts to his castle. They'd sneak up the mountain hidden in military vehicles and then be taken down the next day. Money, women, provisions would all be taken up there secretly, usually when there was a cover of fog. Millions of dollars went up and down that mountain. For relaxation, he had a jacuzzi and a sauna fitted, while there was also a pool, a gym, and a waterfall. Unfortunately, the exotic animals he had once had for his personal zoo didn't end up on the mountain. He did, however, manage to build himself a life-size dollhouse for when his daughter would come to visit. It's thought during his time there he had around 300 visits from guests, but the party would soon be over. The place wasn't even completed when word got out that Escobar had ordered the murder of two cartel members. Some say they were brutally tortured first, while other accounts state they were just shot and buried inside the prison walls. The CIA was listening into his phone calls, so Escobar had to start using carrier pigeons. If they were ever intercepted, on their legs would be a little later that read Pablo Escobar, Maximum Security Prison, in Vigado. After staying up there for just over a year, the Colombian government decided that it was time to send him to a normal prison, which wasn't to Escobar's liking. Some factions of the government had found out about his luxurious lifestyle in his mansion and weren't happy about it. As to the agreement, they couldn't move Escobar, but they could condemn him to a cell if it was at the same facility. Escobar wasn't in favor of staying in a real cell, and the country's extremely corrupt Bureau of Prisons obviously wasn't up to the job of building real cells. Even private contractors were too scared to go up there, with one saying, we're not going to build a cage with the lion already inside. Escobar had to be taken down from that mountain. In July 1992, the 4th Brigade of the Colombian National Army surrounded La Catedral's facility. They had in tow the country's vice minister of justice. The men had guns pointed at the place, and in at least one book it's written that when Escobar ordered the men to lower their weapons, they did. But when Escobar took that minister hostage, all hell broke loose. One man was killed and others were injured. It might never be known just how he managed to walk out of that place, but he seemed to easily get past many armed men who'd been trained by the United States Delta Force. He would evade capture for 16 more months, and then he would be shot dead. If you like this video, then we've got two more great episodes of the Infographic Show that are perfect for you. Check out this video over here or click on the one over here. Don't stop watching now. Click now to keep going.